Thank you, Michael and Mark, for leading us in worship. I really love that second verse of just as I am. Just as I am, not waiting and waiting not to rid my soul of one dark blot. To thee whose blood can cleanse each spot. O Lamb of God, I come, I come. It's just, I think so often when we feel convicted, right? When we feel um, rightfully so convicted of our sin, our response is to run. Our response is to pull an Adam and an Eve, an Adam and Eve and to try and hide ourselves from God's presence. Um, but the beauty of the gospel is that when we feel convicted, when we feel, um, when our sin is exposed, we don't need to hide from God. We can approach him. We can run to him. We don't need to wait to clean up ourselves just even just one little bit. We can run immediately to our gracious Father, who will welcome us in with open arms. Um, and I think that's such a good, a good starting point for the sermon tonight, because we will be, like Mark said, kind of just in the deep end of judgment. Uh, we're uh, really, God is really making clear to us how great our need for him is, how terrible our sin is. Um, you know, one, one pastor of mine would say that you can tell how severe sin is by the punishment for it, right? Like, we sometimes question why would God be so harsh in his judgment? Well, that's because that's how terrible sin truly is. But I also think that this passage that we're in tonight is helpful as we navigate what I would, what I would coin an age of disappointment and disillusionment. Right? Like, doesn't it feel like every day on the news some new beloved figure is secretly a Nazi or something? Right? Like, every day you wake up to hear that this, uh, this television icon who you, who you looked up to or this political leader that you liked or this, this institution that you've been a part of your whole life has this secret underbelly of sin, has this compromising scandal, has this problematic component to it. Like Disney Plus, they had to, officio- they had to issue an apology about all the racism in some of their older movies, excluding Song of the South. So it's, it's crazy. Uh, well, really, we... We live in this age of disillusionment where, where we are kind of realizing that a lot of the things and the people that we thought were great are actually corrupt. They're actually sinful. Um, and that's a hard thing to navigate, to walk through. So I want to ask this question as we start tonight. How do we as believers, how do we remain hopeful in a broken and corrupt world? When we see the pastor that really helped us in our faith fall and sin. When we see the political party we always thought was right compromised and corrupted. When we see the, uh, the movie star that we thought was wholesome turn out to be a secret monster. Um, how do we remain hopeful in a broken and corrupt world? And I think this passage will help us to, to kind of see some of God's response to that, some of the way that we can remain hopeful in a broken and corrupt world. So I'm going to start, I'm not going to read the whole thing. We're going to be in Isaiah chapter 3 verses, uh, versus the entirety of chapter 3 uh, and chapter 4. So I'm not going to read the whole thing up top. I will start with just reading verses um, 3, 1 to uh, 15, and then we'll go from there. Would you guys turn in your Bibles to Isaiah 3, and uh, I'll read it out loud. For behold, the Lord God of hosts is taking away from Jerusalem and from Judah support and supply, all support of bread and all support of water, the mighty man and the soldier, the judge and the prophet, the diviner and the elder, the captain of 50 and the man of rank, the counselor and the skillful magician and the expert in charms. And I will make boys their princes and infants shall rule over them. And the people will oppress one another, everyone his fellow, and everyone his neighbor. The youth will be insolent to the elder, and the despised to the honorable. For a man will take hold of his brother in the house of his father, saying, You have a cloak, you shall be our leader, and this heap of ruins shall be under your rule. In that day he will speak out, saying, I will not be a healer. In my house there is neither bread nor cloak. You shall not make me a leader, the leader of the people. For Jerusalem has stumbled and Judah has fallen because their speech 
and their deeds are against the Lord, defying his glorious presence. For the look on their faces bears witness against them. They proclaim their sin like Sodom. They do not hide it. Woe to them, for they have brought evil on themselves. Tell the righteous that it shall be well with them, for they shall eat the fruit of their deeds. Woe to the wicked. It shall be ill with him. For what his hands have dealt out shall be done to him. My people, infants are their oppressors, and women rule over them. O oh, my people, your guides mislead you. They have swallowed up the course of your paths. The Lord has taken his place to contend. He will stand to judge peoples. The Lord will enter into judgment with the elders and the prince of his people. It is you who have devoured the vineyard. The spoil of the poor is in your house. What do you mean by crushing my people, by grinding the faces of the poor, declares the Lord God of hosts. Uh, please join me in prayer. Dear Lord, as we get into your word tonight, as we look at the, uh, the judgment that you pronounce on sin, and as we look at the hope that you provide to those who turn to you, Lord, I pray that you would open our minds and our hearts to the message that you would have us receive, that you would speak to us through your word so that we could see you more clearly, love you more faithfully, and follow your path. I pray all these things in your son's name. Amen. So as we look at this passage, we see a couple of things. We see God send a purifying judgment on his people. He, he pronounces a purifying judgment that will come to his people, and he makes a promise to preserve them. And, and like Mark said, it's, it's a lot of judgment. <laughs> There's a lot of bad news, but the good news that is in there is very good news, and I think provides a lot of hope for our lives. The first thing that we see in this passage is that the punishment they're going to receive is that they will have a lack of leadership, right? So the punishment that God warns of is he warns that he will take away all their support, including their leaders. We see that in the very first verse, that he will take away support and supply, all support of bread and support of water. That, that phrase, support and supply, was an idiom that meant basically everything that they trusted in, all of the support they counted on. And he really highlights the leadership that will be taken away. He lists every type of leader conceivable, the mighty man, the soldier, the judge, the prophet, the diviner, the elder, the captain, the counselor, the magician, both good types of leaders and bad types of leaders. God is saying that on the day of judgment, when my judgment comes to you for your sin, you will have no leadership to turn to. There will be no person that you can look to and say, this is the guy I can trust in. This is the guy who's going to take care of me. And you even see it kind of illustrated in this little vignette, this little short encounter in verses six to eight, where one guy says, hey, my brother, he's got a coat. He's got a cloak. He should be our leader. <laughs> and, uh, and, this, and this guy with the cloak responds, I don't have a cloak and there's nothing I can do. He, he even says, I will not be a healer. I cannot solve this problem. See, what we see from this, what we see from this judgment is that human leadership cannot provide for our true needs. Often in our culture, we place an idolatrous amount of trust in our leaders. You know, we see it so clearly in, even in just political jargon Right? Even the, the types of things that uh, politicians say on the campaign trail show how we place way more trust, way more hope in what they can get done than, um, we, than we should. Right? Like here's, a, here's an example from um, President Obama's stump speech, the speech that he gave when he first announced his campaign for presidency. He says this, I want to take up the unfinished business of perfecting our union and building a better America. And if you will join me in this improbable quest, if you feel destiny calling and see as I see a future of endless possibilities stretching before us, if you sense as I sense that the time is now to shake off our slumber and slough off our fear and make good on the debt we owe past and future generations, then I'm ready to take up the cause and march with you. Together, starting today, let us finish the work that needs to be done and usher in a new birth of freedom on this earth. Isn't that kind of ridiculous? Like, I lived through the entire Obama presidency. 
that didn't happen, right? Like, <laughs> he didn't usher in a new birth of freedom on earth, not even commenting politically one way or the other. Like the politicians always make these promises of these glorious, idealistic, almost messianic futures that they don't fulfill on. And yet we continue to place our trust in them. And that's what happened in Judah, right? They trusted in their leaders. They trusted that their elders knew what they were doing. They trusted that their counselors knew what the wise path was, that their magicians could work out a good future for them. They placed the trust they should have placed in God in their leaders. And the judgment God promised to send to them is that he would remove those leaders, that there would be no one there to lead over them. You see, our true need is not for human leadership. Our true need is for God to be our leader, God to be our king. Any human king will fail. In 1 Samuel, when Israel asks for a king, this is what God says. And the Lord said to Samuel, Obey the voice of the people and all that they say to you, for they have not rejected you, but they have rejected me from being king over them. Right in Samuel, when the people of Israel said, we want a king to rule us like the other nations, God says, you are rejecting me. I could be your king, but you're choosing a human king. See, they even say, no, but there shall be a king over us that we may be like all the nations, that our king may judge us and go out before us and fight our battles. They wanted a person to go out before them and to fight their battles, a person to stand in judgment over them. They had the God of the universe willing to take that role. And yet they said, no, we want a king. We want someone tall and handsome, someone we can see and trust in. We reject God as our king. Israel chose a human king to fight for them and to protect them. But this, but what we see here is that when the day of judgment came to them, their king was nowhere to be found. Right? When, when God's wrath visited their doorstep, their king could not go out before them and protect them. We need a king who will not fail on the day of judgment. We need a king who will keep his promises, who will rule with justice and equity, protecting and providing for his people. You know, only Jesus is the change that we can believe in, right? Only God can make his people great. We need to stop trusting in political leaders and people and man to do for us what only God can do, to provide for us what only God can provide. And as we move forward in this chapter, we see the sin specifically that Jesus, that God is punishing them for. He highlights in verses 13 to 15 the sin of oppression. Let me read that again. It says this, the Lord has taken his place to contend. He stands to judge peoples. The Lord will enter into judgment with the elders and the princes of his people. It is you who have devoured the vineyards. The spoil of the poor is in your houses. What do you mean by crushing my people, by grinding the face of the poor, declares the Lord God of hosts. You see, God promises judgment because of the oppression that was prevalent in their society. The leaders of God's people took advantage of their power and privilege to oppress the poor. It says the spoil of the poor is in your house. You're crushing my people, grinding the face of the poor. There's this myth that's fairly common in American culture. It's this idea that if you're poor, it's because of some moral failing on your part, right? That you're poor because you're lazy, because you're not working hard enough. Like if you were smarter or worked harder, or if you just worked it out, if you just tried more, then you would not be poor. That if you're poor, it's because you're a bad person. But that's not at all what we see in Scripture. In fact, if you read the prophets, you see very clearly that God cares deeply for the poor, and he will not tolerate oppression. And yet the people of God were oppressing the poor. They were preventing them from living. They were taking what they needed to survive, taking their food, taking their spoil, and grinding their face. And that pattern of oppression, right, of, the, of those in leadership, of those in power, oppressing those with less power, is not just found in Judah, right, at this time period. That's something that we see throughout human history. We can think of examples even in our own present day. 
right? There are a couple examples that I have listed. One is um, predatory lending practices. Here in Philadelphia right now in our city, there are these places that offer payday loans where they take advantage of people who have nowhere else to turn to, who need a little bit of cash to make, to make it through the month, and they give them these deceptive, ensnaring loans that will keep them coming back, that will make it, it's taking advantage of someone with, who's um, incredibly economically vulnerable and trapping them in the cycle of loan and repayment so that they can't get out. Or we also see a lot of for-profit college scams, right? Like I'm sure you've seen the commercials for these different for-profit colleges. They, they sell you this dream of a perfect life that will come if you get this education, that if you, they promise that you'll get a job in the future if you go to their online school or something. And, and what they do is they trick people into taking out loans so that they can pay for this education that never ends up with a job. Um, you know, these are just two examples of the type of oppression that is still prevalent in our society, right? Like we'd like to think that we're not as bad as people used to be, but we are just as bad. Our society is just as corrupt, just as flawed. And as believers, we should fight against oppression, right? We should fight against injustice. We're not all called to dedicate our lives to that, but we are all called to care. We're all called to work as we can to fight oppression and injustice in our society. And the brokenness of our society, the brokenness of this society that we see here in Isaiah chapter 3, it points us to our need for a savior. Right? If you take seriously the condition of the world around you, then it screams that something is broken and there needs something needs to be fixed. Right? Like if if the if I was in Judah at the time and I heard this description of my people, I would realize this can't go on. We can't continue in this type of society, in this type of world. The brokenness of our society points us to our need for a savior. That's why we have the Advent season, right? It's a time that we are looking forward to the coming of a, of a Savior, a time of hoping in a Messiah. Um, you know, the brokenness of our society should make us look to our Savior, hope for his return. And so there's, there's that first type of sin, that oppression um, that Isaiah addresses in this passage. But then he also goes on to talk about another type of sin, about pride. We see this in verses 16 to 4, verse 1. Let me read those now. The Lord said, Because the daughters of Zion are haughty and walk with outstretched necks, glancing wantonly with their eyes, mincing along as they go, tinkling with their feet, therefore the Lord will strike with a scab the heads of the daughters of Zion. The Lord will lay bare their secret parts. In that day, the Lord will take away the finery of the anklets, the headbands and the crescents, the pendants, the bracelets and the scarves, the headdresses, the armlets, the sashes, the perfume boxes and the amulets, the signet rings and the nose rings, the festal robes and the mantles, the cloaks and the handbags, the mirrors, the linen garments, the turbans and the veils. Instead of perfume, there will be rottenness. Instead of, a belt, ro instead of a belt, a rope. And instead of well-set hair, baldness. And instead of rich robe, a, sh a skirt of sackcloth. And branding instead of beauty. Your men shall fall by the sword and your mighty men in battle. And her gates shall lament and mourn. Empty, she shall, she, she shall sit on the ground. And seven women shall take hold of one man in that day, saying... We will eat our own bread and wear our own clothes. Only let us be called by your name. Take away our reproach. So after seeing this prophecy of judgment for the sins of oppression, of idolatrous trust in man, there's the second prophecy of judgment for addressed specifically to the daughters of Zion, to the women of this city, because of their pride, because of their self-seeking vanity. See, it's prideful self-exaltation that is being addressed here. The, the sins of the daughters of Zion was pride. They were seeking their own glory, not God's. They were delighted in the praise of men, not seeking the approval 
of God. This description of their behavior is one, it's it's a it had to be fun to translate. They got to throw that word mincing in there. It's not what I say a lot. Um, but it's so opposite of what God calls for his people to behave. First Timothy two verses nine to ten says this likewise also that women should adorn themselves in respectable apparel, with modesty and self-control, not with braided hair and gold or pearls or costly attire, but with what is proper for women who profess godliness with good works. You see, this isn't an attack on beauty, right? God isn't saying you shouldn't look good, you shouldn't try to look good, but what is, what is on the block here is that rather than seek to glorify God with their looks, seek to glorify God with their bodies. These women were seeking to use their fashion, their beauty accessories to bring glory to themselves. They were seeking to take from God what is God's and give it to themselves. The root of pride is self-idolatry, right? The root of the sin we call pride is worshiping yourself. All creation exists to bring glory to God, Prideful thoughts and actions seek to redirect the glory that should go to God. And if we're successful or beautiful or wealthy, the glory should go to God. The praise should go to the God who created us. And our response to these things should be worship. But the daughters of Zion perverted the gifts that God had given them to steal the glory that was rightfully his. Proverbs 16, 18 to 19 says this, Pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. It is better to be of a lowly spirit with the poor than to divide the spoils with the proud. God opposes the proud, right? God does not tolerate pride because it is, in its essence, an attack on God's glory. It is an attempt to steal from God what belongs to God. And we do the same thing today. We act in ways seeking to bring glory to ourselves, right? There's this thing called Photoshop. <laughs> it, it exists entirely for this purpose, right? Like, I can't think of, like, I guess if you want to, like, Photoshop animals in funny positions. Other than that, most of what Photoshop is used for is to make yourself look better than you actually are, right? Social media is an industry designed for self-glorification, designed for gathering the praise of man because of your external qualities, Dressing well or being beautiful is not a sin, but it becomes a sin when we care more about being celebrated by people than bringing praise to God. As we kind of tease out in our own hearts what is going on here, am I being prideful? Am I seeking my own glory? You kind of ask yourself this question, what is the motivation of your heart? Right? How much time or money are you putting into your attempts to look beautiful? Or, or another way to think of it, what, what type of treatment makes you angry, right? If, if someone doesn't notice your new shoes, does that frustrate you? Uh, and if, if, uh, if, I think anger often kind of gets to our pride, right? Anger typically comes from a prideful place. So if neglect, if people neglecting your appearance or insulting your appearance really, really like sets you off, maybe there's some pride there that you need to work out with God. Right? What is the motivation of your heart? You see, pride is so offensive to God because it is so contrary to his character. God is not a prideful God. He's humble. In, in Philippians 2, verses 6 to 8, we see this description of Jesus. He who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. God humbled himself to become a man, to live the life of a human, to die a shameful death on our behalf. If that is God's character, then pride has no place in our lives. Right? If that's who God is, then we cannot be prideful. See, pride is not... It's not that you don't acknowledge the gifts that God has given you, but it's that you don't act like you deserve them. And so God punishes these women for their pride. He punishes these people for their pride. You see, he warns that he will take away their beauty and honor. 
Isaiah in this chapter lists all the ways they sought to glorify themselves. It's a pretty extensive list. Anklets, headbands, pendants, bracelets, sashes, perfumes, amulets, rings, nose rings, festal robes, mantles, cloaks, handbags. That's really in their handbags. Turbans and veils. This is just like this list um, of a women's fashion. And I don't know modern women's fashion, much less, <laughs> much less what the, these people were doing. Uh, but Isaiah lists all these ways that they were seeking to glorify themselves through external beauty with no thought to worshiping God. And God's judgment removes these things and replaces them with loss. Right? He, he gives them baldness. Sorry, Mark. Um, <laughs> sackcloth branding, right? He, he, they obsessed about their hair, so he takes away their hair. They obsessed about their clothes, so he takes away their clothes and replaces it with sackcloth. And the height of this judgment is that he warns he will take away their husbands. You see, they were delighting in the praise of men. They were delighting in men thinking they were beautiful, and so God removes all of the men from their city. Chapter 4, verse 1 says, And seven women will take hold of one man in that day, saying, We will eat our own bread and wear our own clothes. Only let us be called by your name. Take away our reproach. The, the problem got so bad on the day of judgment that there were seven women to one man because all of the men were gone. God takes away the things that they idolized, the things that they trusted in other than him. You see, the husband at this time period in this place was the primary source of protection and provision for his wife. A woman without a husband was a woman in danger. And, and husbands provided honor for their wife. A woman without a husband was a woman dishonored. And because they sought their own glory, instead of seeking to glorify God, God takes away the things that they sought, the, the glory they tried to claim, and the men who they tried to be glorified by. And as we read this passage, I think it's, it's heavy, right? There's, it's not, not a lot of cheery imagery, not a lot of hope or smiles in these first two chapters, uh, in this first chapter. But what we're seeing here, and I think what we've been seeing throughout the first three chapters of Isaiah, is that God is purifying his people through judgment. In Isaiah chapter 1, there's imagery used there the talk to talk about this judgment that I think really evokes this idea of purification. Isaiah 122 describes the people of Judah saying, your silver has become dross, your best wine mixed with water. Right, so dross is that residue left behind when you're smelting metal. So when, you're, when you get just like a chunk of ore from the ground, it's not pure gold or it's not pure silver. And it has to be heated up in fire, like heated up in a very destructive process that separates the pure silver, the pure gold, from the dross, from the residue that's left behind. And Isaiah 125, the prophet says this, I will turn my hand against you and will smelt away your dross as with lye and remove all of your alloy, all of the impurities in you. So this judgment that God is sending is not just a punitive judgment. It is, right? They deserve their punishment, but this judgment is to purify his people. God sends judgment upon his people that match the sins that they've committed. There's this almost divine irony taking place in this passage. See, the leaders oppress the poor, and the people place an idolatrous amount of trust in their leaders, and so God takes their leaders from them. And the women pridefully sought to glorify themselves through their beauty, and God takes their beauty from them. The punishment fits the crime. There's this divine irony. But not only does the punishment fit the crime, I would say the punishment fixes the crime. Right? That God sends judgment upon his people that remove the things that keep them from him. So they trusted their leaders who oppressed the poor, and so God takes away the leaders. He leaves them with no one else to trust but him. They were prideful and worshiped their own beauty, so God takes away their beauty and leaves them with no one to turn to but him. The punishment fixes the crime. It's this purifying judgment meant to cleanse the people of God. 
there's a quote that I love in the book Problem of Pain by C.S. Lewis, where he's talking about this very concept of why, of how God uses judgment, how he uses pain and suffering for his people's good. It says this, let me implore the reader to try to believe, if only for the moment, that God, who made these deserving people, may really be right when he thinks that their modest prosperity and the happiness of their children are not enough to make them blessed, that all of this must fall away from them in the end, and that if they have not learned to know him, they will be wretched. You see, if you have a comfortable, happy, and successful life, if you have wealth and power, if you have beauty and glory and are celebrated by man, but you don't know God, then you will be wretched on the day of judgment. And so it is God's mercy to his people here that he takes away from them the things they trust instead of him. And when he does that in our lives, when he takes away these things that we think are good, that are keeping us from God, that is his mercy, his kindness to us. You know, and the last thing I think we see in, in which, in, in the way that this judgment is purifying is that God sends this judgment to prepare a people for himself, to prepare a people for him to dwell with. Let's look at verses, chapter 4, verses 2 to 6, as we see God's preserving promise. In that day, the branch of the Lord shall be beautiful and glorious, and the fruit of the land shall be the pride and honor of the survivors of Israel. And he who is left in Zion and remains in Jerusalem will be called holy, everyone who has been recorded for life in Jerusalem. When the Lord shall have washed away the filth of the daughters of Zion and cleansed the bloodstains of Jerusalem from its mist by a spirit of judgment and by a spirit of burning. Then the Lord will create over the whole sound of sight of Mount Zion and over her assemblies a cloud by day and smoke and the shining of a flaming fire by night. For over all the glory there will be a canopy. There will be a booth for shade by day from the heat and for a, and for a refuge and a shelter from the storm and the rain. You see, God promises to preserve his people. He promises to preserve them through the day of judgment for a future that will be glorious. And, and he does this by promising to send them a Messiah. Now, it might not jump out to you immediately where Jesus is in this passage, but in verse 2, you see this description of the branch of the Lord that shall be beautiful and glorious. This phrase, the branch of the Lord, in a lot of translations is capitalized. Because in Isaiah 11, this branch of the Lord is identified with the prophesied Messiah. So in that day when everything is made right, the branch of the Lord will be beautiful and glorious. Jesus will be with his people. You see, the Messiah, this promised king who came 2,000 years ago and will come again, is Jesus. And he will lead his people. This is a beautiful reversal of the judgment that they've just that they that they're going to experience that they experience right they who lost their beauty and yet they'll be beautiful and glorious they lost their honor yet they will have pride and honor you see Jesus is the king of kings he's the perfect leader who will protect and provide for his people and so in this day Jesus will be a king and will lead his people not only will he be a king for them he will be a husband for his church. Uh, verse 5, there's this subtle reference to this wedding that will take place. Uh, it's, it says glory, it says over all the glory there will be a canopy. Now that term canopy and that, that image of a canopy is something that they would only have at wedding celebrations. They would spread a canopy over the celebration. And so this imagery is meant to evoke the idea of a wedding. And it's the same imagery that we see throughout the New Testament, especially in Revelations 19, verses 6 to 9. Then I heard what seemed to be the voice of a great multitude, like the roar of many waters and like the sound of mighty peals of thunder crying out, Hallelujah, for the Lord our God, the Almighty reigns. Let us rejoice and exult and give him the glory, for the marriage of the Lamb has come, and his bride has made herself ready. It was granted her to clothe herself 
for the fine linen, bright and pure, for the fine linen is the righteous deeds of the saints. And the angel said to me, write this, blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. In the New Testament, there's this imagery of Jesus as the groom and his church, us, his church as the bride. That relationship between God and his people is described as a marriage, an eternal union between God, between Jesus who will rule and lead us and care for us and provide us, and his people who he delights in, who he is clothed in righteousness. And we who are invited to this marriage supper are blessed. You see, Jesus is the true husband for his church. He provides us with honor. He protects us. He goes before us and fights for us. And so while the people of Judah at this time despaired at the coming judgment, the judgment they had earned, they could look forward and hope to their coming wedding, the coming wedding of Jesus and his church. The marriage supper of the Lamb. And what we see also in this section is that Jesus is the hope that we long for in a sinful world. Verses 3 to 4 say this, All he who is left in Zion and, re- and he who is left in Zion and remains in Jerusalem will be called holy. Everyone who has been recorded for life in Jerusalem, when the Lord shall have washed away the filth of the daughters of Zion and cleansed the bloodstain of Jerusalem from its midst. You see, we are rightfully, in our flesh and our sin, children of wrath, right? We have done these evils described here in this passage and are deserving of the wrath of God. But God loved us and desired relationship with us, so he sent his son Jesus to die for us, to bear the punishment that we earned, to die in our place so that we could have faith, so that we who place our faith in him could have life with him. Right, we see this in First John 1, verses, 1, verse 8 or 9. or I can't remember which verse. Um, but if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Right, we see the same idea talked about in 2 Corinthians 5. He, who became, he became sin who knew no sin so that we might become the righteousness of God. Jesus died on the cross. Jesus was the way that God chose to cleanse his people of the filth, of the blood stains, of the guilt that we had so that we could be with him forever. And if we place our faith in him, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. You see, God will dwell with his people for eternity. We are looking forward to a future where we will be with God forever. Verses 5 to 6 have this picture of a cloud of fire by day, of a fire by day and a cloud by night. This is a reference to the story of the Exodus, right? The story of the Israelites being led through the wilderness by a cloud, a pillar of clouds and a pillar of fire. And these pillars not only led them, they protected them, they guided them. And this, is, this imagery is, is saying that there will come a day where God will dwell with his people in his holy city. He will dwell with us for eternity. We will be cared for and protected, provided for by the God of the universe in his city. You see, God has planned since the beginning to create and redeem a people to dwell with him for eternity in paradise. What he commanded to Adam and Eve, be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth. What he accomplished through Christ, is to create a people for him to dwell with for eternity. He will be our king, we will be his bride, and we will live with him in joy and security forever. And that's why we can have hope in a broken world, right? That's why even in the face of our own sin and guilt, we can have hope because we look back towards Jesus, towards his first coming as a child in Bethlehem, and we look forward to his return to rule and to reign forever as our king, as our husband, as our Lord. This is why we celebrate the Advent season. So what's the takeaway? We need to stop placing our hope in things that can't save us. Don't place your hope in human leaders. 
There is not a person who will not let you down. There is not a group. There is not a political party. There is not an institution that will not fail you, but God will not fail you. God will not let you down. Don't place your hope in human leaders. Don't Place your hope in human approval, right? Don't live for the approval of man. Don't make your life about what other people think about you because that will fail you. That will not help you on the day of judgment. Not only are these things bad, but they make bad gods. They cannot provide. They cannot protect. Rather, hope in Jesus. Place your hope in Jesus. Live for Jesus in the midst of a sinful world.